From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers, I'm Tim White. Election day turned into election week with vote counting far more labor intensive this year than in years past. This week on the first half of Newsmakers, a political roundtable with early reaction on an intense 2020 election. Stephanie Murray, author of Politico, Massachusetts, 12 News political analyst Joe Fleming and 12 News politics editor Ted Nisi. Good to have you back. Sleep is overrated, isn't it? Who needs yes. <laughs> All right, look, uh, to full disclosure to our viewers, we are having this conversation on a Thursday afternoon. Things are very fluid, but what we do know is this race, at least in this moment, feels very tight um, nationally. <clears throat> you know, that could again change over the next couple of days, but we'll zoom into the Northeast in a moment. But from each of you, I want to know what your top line thoughts are about the presidential election results, you know, so far the race or, or election day the plural um, so far. Joe, what's your top line thought? Well, my top line is the Democrats are rebuilding that blue wall in the Midwest. That looks like the area where they can keep their uh, momentum going in the future, as long as they keep rebuilding that wall. Michigan's looking stronger. They's up by like 2.7% now. So I think the blue wall in the Midwest is going to be key. And I think that's a big, important factor in this election. All right. Ted, what do you think? You know, uh, it, I, I feel like if I was a Democrat, I'd have a very mixed feelings, right? Because uh, they're it looks like they are in good position as we tape this to defeat an incumbent president. That doesn't happen often, right? Uh, he'd only be the fourth elected incumbent to lose in the last century. But, you know, a lot of disappointment for them down the ballot. Everyone thought even the private Republican polling showed they were going to, uh, Republicans were going to lose more House seats. They gained a bunch of House seats. Um, it, I, I think it's going to be tough for the Democrats to take the Senate. Uh, Politico, Steph's uh, shop had a good story today about how uh, the state legislative races, which will decide the redistricting for the next decade, did not go the Democrats' way. So I think, you know, Defeating Trump is a, is a massive thing for the Democrats. I'm not saying that they should be distraught, but I, I do think, you know, they had, there were hopes among a lot of Democrats for a, a landslide kind of night. That, that is not what happened. Steph. The thing I have my eye on, and we won't know the answer to this for a few weeks until we get really reliable exit polling that's kind of weighted to the results, but I'm interested in what the Democratic coalition looked like in this election and the Republican coalition. And what I mean by that is kind of the surprise uh, for some who are following the races closely in Florida, that the Latino vote um, was influential in helping Trump win that state. And I think part of that is kind of a blind spot in polling that doesn't account for the way that the Cuban American experience is different from the Venezuelan American experience, which is different than the Puerto Rican experience. And so Nevada, Arizona, Florida, all of those states kind of shaking out differently, I think, in part because of Latino voters. I want to pivot back to you, uh, Ted, real quickly, because this is something uh, you, you brought up the point that even though it's possible the way things shake out, that President Trump could lose here, it might have actually been a good election for Republicans. And I think one thing that's getting overshadowed a bit here, Ted, but is very important is Republicans did very well in the state legislative races across the country, which will absolutely impact redistricting in those states since 2020 was a census year. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think that matters, you know, yeah, we're, the, this region is going to keep sending lots of Democrats to Washington because of the way uh, partisanship is here, but it still matters because what happens in the rest of the country determines if the Democrats that are sent from Rhode Island and Massachusetts to Washington have power or not, you know, are they chairman and chairwomen of committees? Are they, uh, you know, do they have power in the Senate to shape bills more? Or are they on the outside looking in a bit? So, you know, having the white house, if it happens, uh, will still increase the clout significantly of uh, of a bunch of the senior Democrats who are elected around here. And I do think uh, keeping the House even with a narrower majority is important. But, you know, uh, we've talked how many roundtables have we done, Tim, where we say this next election, Jack Reed could become the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee. And he never actually becomes the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee because it looks like Democrats, again, it depends on the Georgia runoffs and everything. But uh, it, it's at least you wouldn't want to bet a lot of money right now that they're going to have the, the majority next year. So, so yeah, I think... That's why I think it's it's a very it, it looks like a very mixed picture for the Democrats, even though at the top of the ticket they may get their wish and, and get Donald Trump out of office. So I do want to zoom into the Northeast uh, and and Steph, I have a two part question for you. I guess um, look, Biden took both Rhode Island and Massachusetts, not a surprise. But um, the first part of my question to you is 
you know, there was still Trump had support in pockets of both both states. You pointed out um, that more than two dozen towns in Massachusetts flipped from Trump to Biden. What was the difference maker on that? This was really interesting to me, kind of looking at the map uh, from 2016, Trump versus Hillary Clinton, and then switching over to the map from Tuesday. Um, there's just a lot less red. Uh, about two dozen towns, like you said, flipped from Trump to Biden this time. And it's not particularly because people changed their vote so much from Trump to the Democratic candidate, but because so many more people turned out. Trump uh, lost Massachusetts by only, I think, about a percentage point less or more than he did in 2016. But, you know, those voters turning out in those towns was what really turned them blue. Um, and among those towns, um, some you know smaller towns around Worcester, um, up in Middlesex County, and then uh, some kind of in the southeastern part of the state. So what about um, Bristol County? Bristol County, Massachusetts, relatively speaking, um, really leaned right, it seemed like, in, in 2020. That's right. Um, and Ted had some excellent reporting on this, that Bristol County was, you know, one of the strongest places for Trump in the entire state. It's not um, so much of a surprise. You know, Brist Bristol County Sheriff Thomas Hodgson is kind of the one who's been leading a lot of these pro-Trump uh, demonstrations in Massachusetts, leading car caravans up to New Hampshire to show uh, support uh, for the president there. Uh, so definitely, you know, even though Trump, uh, of course, was expected to lose Massachusetts, and he did, that is a pocket of support for him. Joe, one of, the, one of the things we saw on election night, as you remember well, I'm sure, although it feels like 10 years ago, um, was something that actually merit, uh, was happening nationally. And there was a lot of confusion from our viewers and our readers on social media that the Rhode Island Board of Elections and WPRI.com was reporting, uh, even though uh, the, the state was called for Biden, that Trump was up by like 10 points, right, with 88 to 90 percent of the precincts reporting right. and we were getting a lot of people who were confused about how well how, how can you call it for biden when there's it there's you know almost everyone's in and, and trump is winning what, what was we, going on there? well we're seeing the exact same thing nationally now look at pennsylvania i mean what happened was in rhode island at eight o'clock all the people who voted that day their results came in and that was basically a lot of Republicans. Jim Langerman was losing the congressional race. The Republicans are going to pick up about 10 seats in the General Assembly looking at those numbers. Then after 10 o'clock, slowly, early voting, which was about 150,000 people in Rhode Island, started to trickle in, and the Democrats were getting closer. Jim Langerman was slightly ahead. Then later on in the night, they dumped all the mail ballots in, which was another 165,000 votes, and everything went back to normal in Rhode Island for like past elections, Jim Langerman won with 58% of the vote. Uh, the Democrats basically kept their control in the House and Senate. Republicans gained very little in Rhode Island. But again, it's the way it was done in three sections this time. And that's what's happening nationally. It's just taking a lot longer to get your results because of the coronavirus. Ted, I, I give credit where credit is due here. You and I were uh, in the Elections Update Center and the 12 News Studios uh, for hours. And we were looking at your computer and you spotted this really early on. You were like, wow, Donald Trump is, and I don't want to overstate it, the, the Providence and Central Falls went for Joe Biden, uh, full stop. But you did notice that Trump was outperforming, I guess, is that the right word, and particularly in Central Falls. Yeah, I mean, uh, and, and as we've been talking about, this is, again, reflecting something we saw nationally here at home. Uh, you know, Central Falls, a very, Joe knows, a very reliably Democratic city um, and remained Democratic in this election. But I, I, what shocked me, Tim, that night or surprised me, I looked at how many votes Donald Trump had at the polling places that day, which is Joe just alluded to, is only about a third of the total vote. And Donald Trump was already getting about as many votes as he got total in the last election with just a third of the vote in. So I said, wow. And then you watched it. And in the end, Donald Trump did 20 percentage points better in Central Falls than he did uh, four years ago. And, you know, we know Central Falls heavily Latino community. We saw down in Miami, Steph was alluding to earlier, that the different ways um, the subgroups within the Hispanic community can, can feel about things. And our colleague Eli Sherman talked to Mayor Diosa in Central Falls, he, and he cited two things. He said abortion. He said there are a lot of uh, religious voters um, among the Latino population who did not like Joe Biden's uh, positions on abortion rights. And also all the talk about socialism in the Democratic Party, which, you know, like it or not, there are now Democrats getting elected who, who proudly identify as Democratic socialists, uh, did not sit well with everybody in Central Falls who maybe had 
themselves or family that came from places like that. And, you know, in Massachusetts as well, we saw uh, Fall River, New Bedford, both significant increases in tr how Trump did compared with uh, four years ago. So I just thought to see some of these Democratic communities stay Democratic, but see strengthening support for Donald Trump, particularly in the Latino community, when we know the tension around Donald Trump's treatment of um, Hispanic Americans or Hispanic immigrants, uh, just fascinating. And I think it shows voters, you know, don't be too quick to pigeonhole voters. They're, they're complex. Well, I don't want to be too melodramatic here, um, but it, it felt like it, this election, the entire country was in the same movie theater but they were watching a different movie for the last four years and they had very strong feelings on either side. And, you know, without initially anyway, it, it, there might be more separation growing in the coming days, but without like a real clear defined winner up front, a lot of that had to do with the pandemic. It does make you wonder uh, if either party or if the country can find common ground uh, again, Joe, what do you think? Is this is this sort of our future here moving forward that we'll just have such political divides nationally? Well, we've had it for the last what 10, 12 years at least. You don't think um, feel, you don't think this feels different? I, I think it's a little worse now than before. There's no question. But I think we've had it and it's been growing. I think hopefully uh, things could change over the next four years when people realize that if we want to get anything accomplished, we have to work together. Go back to the old days when Tip O'Neill was speaker and Ronald Reagan was president. They would sit down and work things out. You don't have that anymore. Both parties have to realize they've got to work together to make change. Otherwise, there's going to be no change. Whether after this election people feel that way, I'm not sure. I hope so. Steph, um, the Trump campaign tried to leverage the civil unrest following the killing of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and others. I, I saw one ad on during a football game with the ending uh, slogan, uh, jobs, not mobs. Um, did the timing of those protests and riots have an impact, you think, in this election? That's a great question. Um, another thing that I think we'll kind of see shake out in the exit polling data as it becomes more clear. Um, but, you know, one thing that I think is really contributing to the just divisiveness and extreme partisanship in this country is just kind of the way that disinformation is spreading on social media so quickly and often unchecked. Uh, you saw around the election, Twitter kind of putting warnings on tweets where campaigns uh, were saying that they won in a state where they did not or it hadn't been called yet. So all of those things uh, are starting to be put in place. But I think doing that on November 3rd of 2020 was too late uh, to control the spread of disinformation, especially um, on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter, all of those places. I think uh, just especially the summer just feels like this big canyon between uh, different sides of the country just, just became deeper. I want to take a second and talk about polling here. And, and Ted, you, you and I, uh, in some preview stories leading up to the election, uh, we, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, looking back at 2016. And while national polling uh, was pretty much, you know, right on uh, the popular vote, I should say, some some of the polling in the individual states, especially the swing states, were, were really off. Um, and we said that, boy, if it were the same way in 2020, there's really going to be a reckoning uh, for the industry. And I remember talking to you election night, you were like, wow, it does look like polling once again fell short, but your opinion is evolving. Yeah, I mean, and again, like, you know, I should know better. I reported myself, we'll have to be patient this year, but it's hard not to react to the initial results, right? I see Steph nodding, Joe, like we all thought that, like, oh, here we go again. But, you know, as we're seeing the vote coming in places, we're seeing some of the results in the swing states drift closer to the polling averages than it looked like that first night. Florida was a miss, clearly. Uh, that was not as tight as uh, it looked, but you know, the national vote could be on track. And you had some very outlier posts, the Wisconsin, ABC, Washington Post poll. Everyone's going to be talking about that 17 points for Biden. And I think, what is it, under 1% he's at right now there. Um, so I, I, I want to see the final results in these states and compare that to the final polling averages to decide just how much concern we have. But I will say, put the presidential race aside. I was saying earlier, Republicans and Democrats thought that Republicans were going to lose more seats in the House. Uh, Susan Collins was was trailing in all the polls in Maine. She not only won, she won without even having to go to the ranked choice system up there. Um, so there was polling problems, even if the presidential race doesn't turn out to be as big a miss. And part of the problem is, in the end, the presidential race is really 50 individual state races, and you're at the mercy of how well people can pull those 50 individual states, really the, the specific battleground states. But um, 
you know, I just, it's, it's alarming as a political reporter because we do rely, you know, we're always going to rely on polling to some extent to know, have a spiel. Otherwise we're just going on our own gut. And that's, that's probably no more, that's probably less reliable than even a weak poll. Well, let's go to our resident pollster here. Uh, Joe Fleming, um, look, you are, you're the, the most trusted pollster in Rhode Island history. I can say that as a fact. Um, uh, you did not poll in the, in the presidential race, but what do you, what do you make of the polling this year? And I guess my question is, is it hard? Uh, I heard this a lot, particularly post 2016. Is it hard to poll uh, Donald Trump voters? Well, first, polling overall is very difficult nowadays just to get the people to cooperate and be on the phone. But I think what they did this time was they basically looked to see what the profile of a Donald Trump voter was. And a lot of it was a, a white, high school educated, white male. And I think they probably adjusted their polling data to oversample that just slightly to get that into the poll. So those quiet Donald Trump voters are included. And right now, the early numbers I'm seeing, I looked at the real clear average politics average and the results that we're seeing. They're not that far off at this point compared to last time. Now, the national number's off quite a bit, but the state numbers seem to be a lot better this time than four years ago. Steph, I'll just real quick, um, we have a little over a minute left. I, I do want you to weigh in on the polling. Um, and it, just as a, as a journalist, how do you approach a particularly national polling after 2016? How did you handle it? I think what the approach for media outlets should be, um, and this is difficult uh, for a lot of outlets to afford it and to put the resources into it, is to kind of do everything, to do the polling, uh, do reliable, well-done polling, to put reporters on the ground in places where things are happening, um, and, you know, have a combination of that. The coronavirus pandemic makes it really hard uh, to be on the ground in states and, you know, to kind of get a sense of what's going on uh, and read those polls in a better way. One thing I'll mention is that Democrats did not uh, go out and knock on doors the way that Republicans did, which I think we might be pointing to in the next few weeks is one of the reasons why uh, things didn't shake out quite the way that they looked. Um, the Republicans did that all along, and it was kind of a contentious fight in the Democratic Party in some circles on whether to knock the doors or not. Um, and it's an effective way to get the vote out, and that was kind of an advantage that they seeded. All right, Joe Fleming and Ted Nisi from 12 News and Steph Murray from Politico, Massachusetts, thanks so much for joining us. When we come back, Ted Nisi joins me in studio. We go behind the numbers on some local races, including the upset in Rhode Island, House District 15, Barbara Ann Fenton Fung, defeating Speaker Nicholas Mattiello. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Makers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White, and I'm joined by 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi. Ted, you and I, like the rest of America, are very bleary-eyed. I am so sick of you. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't take long. Yeah, let's wrap know. up the show. All right. Uh, let's, we talked the first half uh, a lot uh, about national politics. Mm -hmm. I want to zoom in locally, and yep. I want to actually bring up a tweet from James Pindell from the Boston Globe, a political reporter that you and I uh, both respect very much. And he tweeted out, five mm -hmm. of the six states in New England will have a new Speaker of the House next year. The Democratic speakers in Rhode Island and Vermont flat out lost re-election to a Republican. And of course, he's talking about House Speaker Nicholas Mattiello in that tweet. And I just like that because I think it, you know, we live in a bubble uh, here in Rhode Island or a snow globe, as I like to joke often. And of it's course, the exception would be Bob DeLeo of Massachusetts. That's right. <laughs> yes, he is the uh, surviving Only survivor. Speaker. <laughs> so let's talk about the Speaker in Rhode Island that did not uh, survive here. Barbara Ann Fenton Fung, uh, the First Lady of Cranston defeating House Speaker uh, Nicholas Mattiello. And you and I have talked a lot about this, Ted. I think a big reason that this, uh, that this happened was some of the fallout from the, uh, the Brit trial. Just the optics of a House Speaker raising his hand uh, to, you know, to swear to tell the whole truth in a trial of his former political aide. He wasn't on trial, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. um, and he likes to point out that he was, he was cleared in the AG investigation in that one. But you have that, and then you have some other headlines, and just the weight of the speakership itself, and I think it all piled up. Yeah, I've had a lot of conversations, Tim, this week with people uh, close to the speaker, with uh, folks who've been watching all this closely, and I think 
you know, I think it's true. I think also, I, I think the difference was, yes, has the speaker survived uh, before multiple controversies and scandals mm -hmm. that emanated from the state house? Yes. But if you think about it, often those were one step removed from him. You know, John Carnevale, he, he was a member, a senior person on House Finance for Mattiello, but he wasn't Mattiello himself. And there was no allegation that Mattiello had told him, you know, not to live where he said he lived. Ray Gallison. Mattiello actually blew the whistle on Ray Gallison, though he had, of course, given him an important position. Frank Montanaro with the free tuition. He had an, a position for Mattiello, but Mattiello had not told him to get the free tuition. But this year, the two controversies that dogged him, the convention center audit uh, affair in the first part of the year yeah. that led to a grand jury, and the Jeff Britt trial, were right to Mattiello's own decisions, behavior, and, and people around him. Yes, as you said, Jeff Britt was the one on trial, but it was Nick Mattiello's campaign. And, you know, what did Harry Truman say? The buck stops here. Right. And people, I think, put that on his doorstep, the surveillance of Steve Fry. I was just going to bring yeah. that up. You and I heard that a lot, that the, 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 the thing that came out of the trial that really stuck with people, I think, in District 15, at least we heard, was the fact that the Mattiello campaign conducted surveillance on Steve Frias. Now, we should say that Mattiello uh, denied any knowledge that that had happened, and he said it was at the direction of, of Jeff Britt. But even just that that was going on, it, it felt yucky to people, I think. <laughs> yes, I think it did. I, and so I think there was all of that. I also just think... You know, I think you cannot take away from Barbara Ann Fenton Fung, Definitely. and I would give some credit, as she would, it's not to take anything away from her, to her husband um, for his strong support and guidance. I mean, Alan Fung is a man who knows Cranston politics up, down, and sideways. And by the way, Cranston Republicans had a good night on, presidential leaders are tough for Republicans in Rhode Island. Cranston Republicans, Ken Hopkins won the mayorship. He will succeed Alan Fung. Uh, Barbara Ann Fenton Fung defeated the Democratic House Speaker. The Republicans kept the council in Cranston. Alan Fung has a lot to feel good about, uh, and his wife does too. She was a first time candidate who saw the opportunity, seized it, and knew what she was doing. We're talking on a Friday morning. Last night, our colleague Steph Machado was um, in Warwick for a caucus that the Democratic House, uh, the House Democrats held, and they threw their support behind Joe Shikarchi. He is a representative from Warwick. He was first elected to the General Assembly in 2012 and became uh, Majority Leader in 2016. Briefly walk us through the process. This does not mean he's House Speaker. He is not House Speaker yet. He will be House Speaker, barring something incredibly shocking. Uh, he has now been endorsed by the Democratic Caucus. Unlike most um, of the jobs in the legislature, the House Speaker is elected by the full House, including the Republican members. Now, the Democrats have an overwhelming number of votes, right. so they in the end will choose it. And so the caucus where they endorse a speaker, they've endorsed Joe Shikarchi now, uh, tells us who will have the votes when they come back in January. We do have a funny situation here, Tim, where because usually it doesn't matter that the old, speak, the old speaker's still around for two months if there's going to be a change because there's no more sessions. Supposedly, we're supposed to still have a special session this fall for them to finally finish the state budget for a fiscal year that's almost halfway done. Do you done. think Mattiella will see it through? You know, I've heard different things. Certainly right now, there's been no indication Mattiello will step aside and let Shikarchi become speaker early. Um, but, you know, he, he's a lame duck. He's lost his, his power, uh, even if he will still wield the gavel. Even just negotiating, you know, who does who But does I wonder Governor if that Ramondo might help him in negotiation where he's not beholden politically to anything. Perhaps, but it also means if I'm Governor Raimondo or Senate President Ruggiero, I, I don't know if I trust that, you know, first of all, why right. do they need to give him anything? They don't, they're done with him. And also, can he, can he bring his people along for tough votes uh, when he, none of them owe him anything politically anymore? Well, and the big, thing on the, the, the big thing on the table will be the deficit. And I was following you on Twitter last night. You tweeted something uh, about a $900 million defi deficit that was referenced at the uh, caucus on Thursday night. And you pointed out you think that figure is outdated. I do. Tim, that $900 million figure, which people are throwing around constantly right now, that is a height of the lockdown estimate. It's a real estimate, but it was from the springtime when there was such uncertainty about the economic effects of the pandemic. And it, it, since then, we've learned a lot more. The uh, revenue did not collapse as much as expected. Think about it, the $600 unemployment bonus checks that people got each week. Those were taxed. So income tax receipts were OK uh, to some extent. Um, spending was not as high in some places as expected. The feds are providing more help with Medicaid costs. Just yesterday, over $100 million less will need to be spent in that area. Uh, revenue is coming in a little higher than expected. So again, the state has a significant budget deficit problem. It's not that I want people to think I'm, I'm minimizing it, but $900 million is such a shocking figure to make people think, what can we possibly do? It's more at the, the range of a, a difficult but 
problem they can deal with. You're not giving a number, though, I noticed. Uh, I, you know, I've heard, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, there's no official number yet. I've heard some people are saying maybe it's more closer to 300 million than 900 million, but we do need to see. All right. So real quick, minute left in the show. Uh, I want to go back national. Uh, you and I talked about, uh, of course, Joe Biden won in Rhode Island as expected, but still got support, uh, a lot of support for Donald Trump from voters, particularly on the, as I like to say, the left side of the state when you look at a map. Yeah, the um, left side of the state's the right side that's of the state. That's right. Conservative. Uh, is that the state going more conservative, relatively speaking, or is that a Trump phenomenon, you think? You know, I think we, we need to see more elections to know. I don't think it's just a Trump phenomenon. You saw a very similar map between Governor Raimondo and Alan Fung in the 2018 yeah. election, right down the middle. I think we're seeing some of the same trends in Rhode Island. You see it there on screen that we are seeing nationally. Uh, places that are more in the interior, uh, whether it's the interior of the country, where you see those big swaths of red across yeah. the Midwest and the Great Plains, uh, and the interior of Rhode Island are, is more Republican friendly, and people more densely packed urban areas near the coast is more Democratic. And, and Rhode Island in that way, I think, is very much reflecting trends. Just the difference is there are far more people. Uh, there's, there's a very clear majority in those bluer areas, which is why it's not close for someone like Joe, Joe Biden or Trump. Donald Trump got 15,000 more votes in Rhode Island than 2016, but Joe Biden picked up two towns, Lincoln and West Warwick. Ted Nisi, uh, despite the disparaging thing you said about me at the top of the segment. <laughs> I'm uh, kidding. Good job I, I could this never week. be sick of Tim. <laughs> All right. <laughs> if you missed any of it, it's online, WPRI.com. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on News.